you're such a genuine gem, thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is going to be taken from her crib, the Sabrina Eisenberg case. Now, many would make up their minds about this case before the full story was even out. However, I do wonder if, without the judgment, if an entirely different set of opinions would arise. So, we're going to be talking about the less popular theories in this case with my own personal insight. By the way, I post so much content like this. It's my passion to tell these stories and if you're not subscribed, I would really love if you would. It would make my day for you to support this channel and these cases because there is a series or something coming in the near future that I'm sure you won't want to miss out on. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1997 in Florida and the Eisenberg family lived in Valrico. Now this was the parent Steve who was a real estate agent and Marlene who had three children. It was an eight-year-old named William, a four-year-old named Monica, and a four-month-old, almost five-month-old, named Sabrina. They were a pretty average family living a great life, however that November everything would be turned upside down. It was the 23rd and Marlene would wake up to the sound of the fish tank. It was going bad and it was loud, horrendous, and she knew she had to wake up pretty soon anyway, so she just decided to wake up, go into the kitchen, and make herself some coffee. Her oldest son, William, was who she went into the bedroom and woke up first because I'm sure he took the longest to actually wake up, so she woke him up first. And that is when she noticed that the back door was open. This was a back door that went to the garage. She thought this was very strange, but she decided to walk over to it and that is when she looked out onto the street and she realized that the garage door was open as well. Now she kind of panicked because of course if you're looking out onto the street from your house when you haven't opened the door, that's a little scary. Now their dog Brownie hadn't barked that entire night. However, it was a very friendly dog who was very welcoming to strangers. It didn't often bark so this wasn't something that was like, oh, we would have heard the dog bark. It was more like, well, the dog may have barked, may have just went up and licked the person and like they couldn't they couldn't say that brownie was a guard dog whatsoever but mother's intuition made marlene run into her youngest child sabrina's bedroom it was the closest to the garage and she just had a feeling that she needed to go check and when she went in there and she peered in sabrina's crib no one was there and neither was her little yellow blanket that she always slept with her other two children monica and william were still in the house and they were doing completely fine and the entire family had sat down the night previous, watched a movie together before going to bed. She, she had tucked all of her children in and now Sabrina was missing. After the 911 call and Marlene woke her husband up to watch the other kids, Marlene ran to the next door neighbor's house, frantically knocked on the door and told the neighbor that her baby had been kidnapped. Now, the investigators got to the home and found very little evidence inside. They found one blonde hair inside the crib. And of course, all of the other family members had brown hair. And so this was kind of strange. However, it could have been from a number of different things. And there also was a footprint on the skirt of the crib. Just a piece of fabric that drapes down to the floor. And there was a footprint on this as well that kind of showed that someone was there and none of the family members, of course, would have been wearing, you know, dirty shoes with the crib and it was not thought to be there before that night. There was no sign of forced entry and canines were brought in to follow the scent of Sabrina and they followed it out through the back door and down to their fence. However, it stopped about there. Now, Marlene and and Steve were of course questioned and they said they believed that they had accidentally left the garage door open that night and they always left the back door to the garage unlocked because during the day their kids would go out and play so they wanted them to be able to go in and out easily with them half without them having to go and unlock the door every time. Now a tip was called in from a man according to the Thinking Sideways podcast and this tip said that this neighbor of the Eisenbergs who lived far enough 
enough away that they didn't ever hear each other or really talk to each other, but they were close enough to call each other neighbors, you know, that kind of neighbor, um, that he was a neighbor and he was out at about 1 a.m. taking his dog out to go to the bathroom and he opened the door and he heard a baby crying and he had never heard Sabrina ever in the four months, five months she'd been alive cry from you know the distance that their houses were and so he thought it was kind of kind of weird that he was hearing this baby cry you know nothing around him was a house it was kind of more a woodsy area but he didn't see anything so he went back inside this tip could not be confirmed however from this neighbor and then the fbi came in to assist and took the entire crib of sabrina's to test it for dna but nothing came of this either first suspects who were brought in for questioning were sabrina's parents steve and marlene and now they were brought in for lie detector tests and steve came back as passing however marlene came back as inconclusive now we know that polygraph tests are so inaccurate really i mean there's really nothing that says that they are a good way to prove guilt or innocence of somebody but this definitely made the investigators look deeper into the parents because Marlene's was inconclusive. Two days later, the Eisenbergs would get a lawyer due to the huge media storm that had just ensued due to a public statement that they had created, a public appeal that they had filmed. And they had been instructed to do so to kind of get the information out about Sabrina. However, this really backfired on them. And Steve's brother was a lawyer and immediately called them and said, look, you need to get some sort of a lawyer to have your back on this because people were saying that during this recording that Marlene, who did the talking, appeared cold and unemotional. However, they would say that the police were coaching them on exactly what to say, that they were scripted, that everything they were doing, they were trying to do in the most professional way and hold in their emotions. They were coached on how to do this and yet it came across very unnatural. Later, the couple says police coached them in this televised plea. Please bring our baby back to us. She needs her mother and her father and we all miss her and love her very much and we need her to come home to us please they were trying to gain sympathy from her possible abductors and yet this just backfired because now everybody around them thought that they had done something instead of focusing on someone who could have taken sabrina and then to make matters even worse for the eisenbergs footage would come out because they were constantly being watched by everybody at their house everywhere they went and they had gone to, with investigators to a car outside of their home to go somewhere and the two parents were caught smiling at each other. Now, you wouldn't think that this is a huge thing. Uh, they're just smiling. However, this was very soon after their child had been abducted, or so they said. And so many people said this is quite strange behavior from parents of a missing child. And they had come forward saying, you know, an investigator made a joke and we were just laughing to be nice. It was funny. It wasn't like we were having a grand old time. It was just a little joke and we smiled. Now Marlene was brought back in for another polygraph test and at this point she was allegedly told that statistically the people who are involved in the abduction of a baby from a crib is always the parents. And she was questioned once again for this polygraph and it came back inconclusive once again which just made it even worse investigators told the parents they believed they knew what happened to their daughter and at this point the parents completely stopped working with the media and the police all together and investigators would go and search the 12 miles around their house in the woods and even dug up the property of her father, Steve, because of course he was a real estate agent. He had just sold a property and they went to this property. These people had just bought the house and now their yard was being dug up because they thought maybe Steve had buried her there. They also looked into video footage taken of Sabrina a day prior to her disappearance. It was of her crawling. It was the first time she was crawling and her whole family was around her kind of like cheering her on and the investigators said that looking closely they could see bruises on Sabrina's head and they called Child Protective Services who went to the Eisenberg house and began talking to the other two children and these other two children said there's no way my parents have never hurt any of us ever were completely fine and they didn't find anything so they had to leave. 
It was also found that a couple of days prior to Sabrina's disappearance, another baby's room in another home had been broken into partially. It was like the window had been partially busted out, although no one ever came in and of course the baby wasn't taken. However, this was to a baby's room and it was in the same neighborhood as the Eisenbergs. While all of this was happening at the parents' home, the police also decided to bug their house and their phones. Now, now, some of these conversations that the investigators would overhear would be taken to a judge because they believed they had heard the parents talking about killing Sabrina. Some of the things that they had heard were, I wish I hadn't harmed her. It was the cocaine. And the baby's dead and buried. It was found dead because you did it. The baby's dead no matter what you say. You just did it. These were so hard to understand. These tape recordings were so horribly muffled that you couldn't hear anything. And so the judge immediately said, throw it out. That's not evidence whatsoever because it's basically like when you're trying to find hidden messages and songs. What you want to hear is what you're going to hear. And so when you put subtitles over a tape recording, of course, it may sound a little bit like it, but that doesn't mean that's what they said. And like it's been said many times, with this bugging of the house, this could have been a TV. This could have been somebody talking about something to somebody else. Like it just, you can't 100% prove that it was Steve and Marlene talking to each other, saying these exact things about Sabrina. Then at this point, one year after Sabrina had disappeared, Marlene and Steve were actually arrested and brought in for obstructing the investigation and lying to police. Basically anything to get them in custody. They barged into the Eisenberg home and took in Marlene. They barged into Steve's job, took him, took him into and basically were holding them on anything they could. However, they had to be released because there was lack of evidence against them. They couldn't prove that they did anything to Sabrina. But I mean, so many rumors were being spread about the family by then. There was even one that said Marlene had cheated on Steve with another man. And so Sabrina was this other man's and Steve found out about this and killed Sabrina because of that. By 2008, this case was still unsolved and a man named Dennis Byron was a criminal who was also an informant for police who had been given a tape recorder to talk to his cellmate named Scott D. Overbeck. And Scott had previously confessed to Dennis, allegedly, that he had kidnapped Sabrina. And so, of course, Dennis was trying to get Scott to say this once again. Before these two were in jail together, Scott had allegedly told Dennis that he had retrieved a boat from the Eisenbergs with Sabrina already in it, and he was instructed to get rid of her, To at which point he chopped her up and dumped her in the crab traps along the water. And he allegedly even showed Dennis where this ski boat was. The Eisenbergs said that they never had a boat, nor did they ever see or know who Dennis or Scott were. And Steve even said, all you have to do is check public records for boat ownership and see that we never owned a boat. So, I mean, the whole story was another one of those fabricated stories to try and disbarge Marlene and myself. I know there are always going to be people who think Marlene and I had something to do with Sabrina's disappearance. We did not. We did not. There was also speculation that a Jane Doe could be Sabrina and her name was Paloma Unknown. And she looked just a little bit older. She was speculated to be two at the time that she of course came in and was a known as a Jane Doe officially, but she had been brought by her alleged mother across the border near McAllen, Texas. And she had been brought to a registered nurse. The mother could no longer take care of her, didn't want to take care of her and was signing adoption papers over to this nurse. And this was in May of 1998, which would be six months after Sabrina disappeared. So she would be about one and they were thinking she was about two, which at that time it can be a little iffy. Paloma Unknown at this time was two feet tall, 10 inches, 23 pounds, with black hair, brown eyes, and a small scar below her belly button. She is now in Illinois with a family who wants to adopt her and yet can't because they don't have a birth certificate, they don't know who she is. So also in that case, please, if you know who this is, please let them know so this little girl can be adopted. But DNA 
was tested against the Eisenberg family and this was found not to be Sabrina, unfortunately, even though she truly resembles Sabrina and her family and it's just, it's weird, even down to those little cheeks. I just can't get past those cheeks. 22 years later and Sabrina's parents still do interviews to get the word out about her. They do believe that nobody kidnaps a baby just to kill them and they have no reason to believe that she isn't alive so they're still gonna continue to believe she is and that she's in her 20s living a normal life. They ended up actually moving out of the area that they had been living in with Sabrina due to the fact that they had so much scrutiny from police and media and they were afraid that they wouldn't be able to raise their children to respect the police in that area because of how they'd been treated so they wanted to move away so they could teach their children that. They also say that that little bit of footage that had them pleading for Sabrina's life and for her abductor to return her that so many people say incriminated them. Marlene said that that took everything in her to be composed during that interview, but that's what she was told to do. And then the minute they turned the cameras off, she broke down. But of course they weren't still rolling them. And so nobody could see that but she was really just following instruction from police trying to do her best to get her daughter back. Marlene said, you know, people have said about us in the beginning, how could you have not had a nervous breakdown? How could you not? And I'm like, well, I have a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. When things would come out and people would start talking and staring, we just marched on. We just lived life with the kids, you know? They deserved a normal life. Today, the Eisenberg family actually keeps a room open for Sabrina, decorated for her. For a long time, it was still that baby room with a Rib. However, they've since updated it because she would be in her 20s today. And in November of 2008, this family got the best news that they could. That was that a lady was coming forward saying that she was around the same age as Sabrina. She had a birthday close and she thought she could be her. She had found that she only had baby pictures after five months old. She also had a fake social security number and she truly believed she could be an Eisenberg. There was also another woman who came forward at this point saying that she could be as well. These two were set to have DNA tests against the Eisenbergs and these are said to take about six months. However, this happened back in 2018. We still haven't heard anything about these matches and it's so frustrating because I wanted to give you guys an update, but there is literally no updates. It's just like this entire story that had happened just dropped off and nobody wants to hear about it anymore, which kind of makes me think that they came back as not a match because I feel like we would have heard about it if not, unless the family for some reason wanted to keep it a secret, which I kind of hope in that case they do if, if it is Sabrina so she can live a normal life. But I mean, I'd love to hear that she was safe. But her father says, we hope every day, hope is what keeps us going and moving forward. But this is an age progress photo of what she would look like today. And if you have seen her or know any information, please call the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office at 813-247-8200. Do you think the parents are guilty? I think for one, the police really wanted them to be. However, do I think they personally were? I'm not sure. And the mother's 911 call sounded extremely extremely real to me, extremely genuine. I feel I'm, a, I'm an empath, so I, which some of you guessed, and I love that you can feel that through the screen, but I can truly feel someone's intentions when they're talking to me. I have a extremely accurate gut and intuition, and it's strange, but that call sounded to me like that was genuine. I do not think the mother at that point knew what happened to her daughter. Did she later on, did she, you know, come across some information? Did she get told by one of her other family members later on? That I can't tell you, but during the 911 call, I do think it was a genuine fear response. And I know that the little video they filmed later on seems extremely fishy and she is just kind of very emotionless. However, if you think about somebody starting a YouTube channel for the first time, being on camera for the first time, they're going to be a little strange. It's going to come across as kind of hard to watch because it's weird to be on camera if you're not used to that, especially if they had police sitting there telling them what to say and how to act. And that can be a lot, especially when you're going through a traumatic event that your child is missing. And I don't think that we can just say, oh, she was very strange on camera because to be honest, we see so many times when people can act so regular and act exactly how we want them to. And we find out that was really just an act that they 
we didn't question them because they were so good at pretending to care when really they were responsible for it all along. So I really don't think we can just say because of one little video that they are guilty. Now with the laughing that they were seen doing, I know that some will say, oh, it's just laughing or some will say that's definitely not how you would react. However, like we always kind of struggle with, we cannot judge a person's trauma response because everyone is so different. And it depends on the trauma you've been through previously in your life. Because I, for one, have been through extended periods of trauma where I have still found a reason to laugh. Because if you're going through it for quite a long time or if you've gone through it previously, you kind of have a stronger threshold to how much you can handle and no ways to cope and I for one try to make something good out of it for other people especially if other people are struggling getting them to laugh to kind of lighten the mood because it can be a very low depressed state you can get in and if you have a brain that's continually living in that state it can be very detrimental and so I think, I mean, they hadn't been in this situation for very long, but it could have been just a way to release some of that anxiety and fear because you can't constantly live in that 24 seven and be okay. Our brains do strange things to keep us going forward. And, and especially in a thing like this, they weren't just like manically laughing during an interview like they were walking out to a car with investigators who could have told them a joke and they smiled it wasn't anything malicious in any way i know i'm more biased in this theory towards the family and that they're not guilty and that is just because i don't know i have seen so many families blamed for missing persons cases here recently and i or just anything that happens to their family members and I can't even imagine how that would feel being innocent and I'm not saying they are but I'm just saying if they are being innocent and then having people look at you like you aren't at that has to be the most frustrating. And for them to still be doing interviews today where they are ridiculed by the interviewers, like I have watched so many on Stephen Marlene where they are just bombarded by aggressive questions from these interviewers and they're mean and they continue to go on these interviews not because they're enjoying it but because it would help their daughter come home. I think a more likely theory if you are leaning towards Steve and Marlene having something to do with it or at least knowing about it is that possibly one of their other children had something to do with it. I hate even bringing up this theory because it's kind of just blaming the family once again. However, it would explain a lot. I mean, whether this was an accident or an anger or just a sick, disturbed child that they had that hurts the baby, I do think that this would explain some of the parents' reactions and how at first, of course, the mother seemed like she was just absolutely devastated and then she acted a little more calm later on because it would be hard to be torn from the guilt of one child and the death and justice of another. And yes, this does remind me of another case, which I can't say the name of her, M.M., um, because it'll be demonetized. I don't know, YouTube's crazy about that case. They don't want anybody to make money off of it, but, but I just can't imagine as a family going through a traumatic event and then being blamed for it and not being helped whatsoever when you're asking for help so thoroughly and you're saying, I didn't do it, please look elsewhere. You can look at me and look somebody else because Steve and Marlene have said, please look at us, please investigate us, but also look elsewhere. They say that they're not trying to deflect off of themselves and you know, if somebody believes it's them, investigate them, but also do other people and make sure you're investigating all leads and all tips. So when it comes out that it's not them or if it comes out it's not them, they also looked elsewhere, which they have never done. And this case is still unsolved. I mean, what do you think happened? I can't believe that Paloma and Unknown isn't Sabrina because of how similar they look. Could Sabrina have been sold into human trafficking? I think that that's, or an underground adoption type thing. I think that those are all plausible. And her being a baby taken from a crib, I can't even imagine. It's disturbing that anyone would do that. It's disturbing that somebody would blame the parents. It's disturbing that the parents could do it. It's just all disturbing. But I will leave it there before I get even deeper. Yeah, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and 
I love you to absolute pieces. I almost forgot, but I always do. I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.